Thank you, thank you, Mark. And, and as he said, if I had known who was before me, I would have never agreed to do this. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to give a very, very quick talk. It was kind of challenging because um, this is meant to be a talk that's like one hour, but hey, let's try and do it in 20 minutes. Um, and I want to start off by saying that we live in a really free, free world, right? We live in a world um, online that mostly I'm talking about online here because, you know, it, it, Everything basically nowadays you can get for free. Uh, offline is still difficult. Um, you know, nothing is for free, so especially train prices here in the UK. But we get a lot of free stuff. And if you think about it, especially for instance in our industry, we get source hosting for free. You get binary hosting. You get continuous integration. You get um, email. You get website hosting. SSL certificates now. Who's not doing SSL? Everyone's doing it brilliant. Well, well, well done you. So if price stopped you, you get that for free as well. You even get monitoring for free. And it's a really good business model. It's called the upsell model, right? In that you use something for free, you provide a paid version for some features, and then you profit. Okay, and it works really, really well. I'll give you a simple case example. Git hosting. Is it open source? Yes, I'll host it on GitHub. Is it a closed source? Yes. Do I care if people see the source? No, I'll host it on GitHub. Do I care if people see the host? Yes. Oh, I'll go to Bitbucket. And I'll save $7 a month, right? Because Bitbucket is free for private hosting. So that sometimes works. And more or less, it's going OK. Then, of course, we have the unicorn business model. How many are familiar with that? The unicorn business model, to, I write it in code so we all understand. You basically come up with a product and service, and then you get a bunch of users for that product and service. And then you go into this loop of VC rounds, they're called, in which you get a VC round, you burn cash, you put on great shows, a lot of marketing, a lot of sales, a whole bunch of things, and then you start to see what your valuation is like. And if it's really good, you go IPO. If not, you get another round, and another round, and another round. Um, if the shit hits the fan and you're out of rounds, you'll write a blog post on Hacker News. I created a startup, here's what happened. And VCs are awesome. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, they are brilliant. Venture capitalists are brilliant people and they, they're, they're doing a lot for us. In fact, I read a, le a letter by Casey Young, uh, uh, she had written some time ago, a, a selfish love letter to venture capitalists in which she was saying that it is brilliant how a lot of my life is being subsidized by venture capitalists, right? I get things for free, I, I, I have tools, services, a whole bunch of things that maybe not always free, but it's getting injected with so much VC that I don't have to pay the full price. And the beautiful thing about this is that you don't have to come up with an amazing idea to get a good valuation. I mean, you know, we've all heard of Snapchat, which apparently is a chat that you take pictures and you put funny things on your head. Um, so you can come up with very good ideas it's just, as long as you just align it with something else, you know, like <laughs> I'm Airbnb for hamsters or um, uh, we want to Uberize cat shaving or want to see. <laughs> You do that and you'll get VC. And in fact, you don't even need to create that fancy website. You can just go to a website down there. It's called Tiff Sang. And they even come up with ideas for you. They, they do the website. They'll create a team for you. And they'll even come up with ideas. So if you like strokes, create something that other people like to stroke. Uh, Meet Magazine, to manage your organization's magazine online with our cloud software. I thought, you know what? I'll come up with Fitbit for dogs. Unfortunately, that really exists. <laughs> And it, that is not one of those generated websites. That really does exist. It's called Fitbark. Yes. I'm getting a dog, actually, in one and a half months, so I might put this one on her. It'll go along with my Fitbit. Anyway, we've got a free ecosystem to build on as well. We've got free libraries. We've got free frameworks. We got, and it's all open source. And, you know, we've, right now, NPM. Who's familiar with NPM? It's brilliant, right? It's hit like a billion downloads a week. That is fantastic. And then someone pulled a package. And then it all fell apart, right? We're building on all these packages, and if someone deletes it, it all falls apart. And why stop there? Why go to packages? We can build on trust of Docker, because you know, creating base images yourself saves time. So let's build on things that other people have built, and we don't know exactly what's going on in there. And it, it'll all be good. But of course, the reality is that we're paying, right? We're not paying directly. But if we're using, for instance, an OSS project, you know, well, who maintains it? How long is it going to be around for? What if they get bored? 
People actually get bored and they move off. Team leads leave projects and they move off and sometimes other people don't pick it up. And we've, we're living with this perception that, you know what, if it all collapses, I will take that project, fork it, and build it myself. How many of you here have fixed a bug to a large open source project that you use? Right. That's very, actually very good. We've got this infrastructure in the case of the NPM, for instance. You know, when that happened, someone pulled a package, the immediate response was, what a ruthless, horrible person that they pulled a package, right? You have to be a really stupid developer to do something like that when so many people depend upon you. No, excuse me, where was your SLA on this free service? Where was your backup, right? You can't blame someone else for your dependencies. And that VC back service that we use, you know, at some point, believe it or not, VCs do want to cash out. So the moral of the story here is that, yeah, we got a lot of free, but you know who owns your availability? You, right? And just because it's free doesn't mean that we don't have to pay on the side in another way or for something else. And in case we didn't know that whole thing of let's just get a million users, 15 million users means nothing. Here's everything me. I loved it. I used to use it. Did I pay for it? No. $35 million in three rounds. 15 million users. Shuts down. But it's not only, you know, services. We get free information, right? This is El Mundo, which is a Spanish newspaper that thinks it's left wing but doesn't know what it really is. Um, and this looks pretty good, right? Let me show you how this looks when you go to it naively, like my, my sisters or my family that don't use ad blockers, like that. In fact, it doesn't even look like that. When you first go to it, it looks like that. Um, in Spain, we've picked up on this whole, whole online advertising. Um, so we pr you know, create 90% advertising and 10% bullshit. And this is what you get, right? Now, I use an ad blocker, fantastic, it's brilliant, right? It's, it's awesome because I get to see all of the information without any of that crap. Um, and I use some other sites and they say to me, oh, you know, you're gonna have to wait a little bit. And then when I go to it, it's like, oh, you're using an ad blocker. I'm sorry, you're gonna to have to either disable that ad blocker or pay me. I'm like, this is disgusting, this is awful, how dare they? Um, the Telegraph, for instance, in the UK, if you read more than five articles, which is already hard to do. Um, if you read more than five articles, uh, it says to you like, oh, no, that's enough, you need, to, um, you, know, you, know, you need to do something else. What do you use? You fire up the Chrome inspector and you remove that overlay? No, you just go into incognito mode in your browser and say, no, there you go. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm reading those articles. But at the end of the day, we're paying, right? How are we paying? We're not paying. How many of you are paying for a service here from reading new online news? Right, how many of you are actually using ad blockers? Brilliant. There you go. But you know how we're paying? By degrading the quality of information. You know, we're driving journalism down to the ground. Who cares? You know, they need to sustain themselves. Let them think of a sustainability model, not me. So we'll just get less value in journalism. And we're blurring the line between news and content marketing. Content marketing, that fabulous thing that everyone should be doing, right? I mean, if you go here, it's very clear. This is for booking.com. Why? Because it traces me everywhere I go in my life. And, but if you go here, you know, you don't see. Now it kind of starts to blur in, right? What is news? What is not news? Some sites do say, oh yeah, this is a sponsored feature. Other ones, other people call it native advertising, right? It's where you kind of like blend in the news by some company that's paying for that news to be in there. So in, if, if we didn't have impartiality enough already, or partiality enough already in news, now we get company partiality as well. But some say, you know, in a world of social media, traditional media is becoming completely irrelevant, right? I mean, now, you know, social media has provided us with a voice for all. News is actually crowdsourced. Yeah, I don't need to go to the Telegraph or the Independent or the Daily Mail or what. Never mind that one. Um, I don't need to go to all of these things to try and get my news because I get it on Twitter. And we've created these amazing, uh, you know, communities. How many of you remember AOL? Right, and they said, oh, that's a walled garden, right? Well, now we've got four walled gardens. Well, no, three, because I, I, I think there's like some, nothing even growing on Google+. But... <laughs> 
you know, we've got Snapchat, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, and they're creating these amazing walled gardens that we are there and we get information. And who's there? Our friends, our family, because we need to keep in touch with all those 1,800 people and see what they're eating every day. And it is fantastic. And of course, this leads us to a, way, uh, to a place where we get very non-biased information. I don't know if you recently heard that there was a former Facebook worker that said, we routinely suppress conservative news on Facebook. Now, that could be true, that could be not true, we don't know. Mark Zuckerberg came out and said, no, we actually don't do anything like that. And in fact, let me focus on this point. He said, um, we have the power, you know, the social media, that's what social media makes it unique. We are a global community where anyone can share from a loving photo of a mother and her baby to intellectual analysis of political events. And then they go and ban a loving photo of a father cradling his sick son in the shower. Why? It's pornography or it's profanity, right? So exactly who decides what gets banned and what doesn't get banned? Someone is doing it up there, right? And then you think to yourself, oh, well, you know what they've done? They've gone and introduced timelines and moments for us. How many of you like Twitter moments? Yes, I thought so. Um, <laughs> And they say to you, it's giving you the information that matters the most. It's about your needs. It's something that you care about first. Who is deciding what I care about first? A person on the other end, an algorithm, who is caring? How do I know the information that I'm getting for free is actually not biased? Well, all information is biased. But who's driving it this time? right? Who really is in control? In fact, does it even matter who's in control anymore? Right? Because we have come into a society of information overload. How many of you have heard of Orwell? Obviously, everyone, right? And Orwell pictured a society of big brother and control and censorship in which, well, none of that is happening, thankfully. Um, <laughs> now, there was another guy named Aldous Huxley who have read, who's read A Brave New World. He imagined a world of controlled population where you could, you know, genetically modify genes. Thankfully, that's not happening. No, no, wait. Um, amusement, and you were just like overloaded and amazing. And Neil Postman wrote a book some time ago called Amusing Ourselves to Death. How many have read it? Very good book. You should definitely read it. More relevant now than it was back in 1984. And in it, and this is the only thing I'll read, he says, what Orwell feared was a, for those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Sounds familiar? Orwell feared we would become a captive society, captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture preoccupied with some equivalent of the fields, the orgy porgy, and the centrifugal bum, bumble bumpy. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. And this book is about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. Unfortunately, Neil Postman was wrong because we've got the best of both worlds, right? He was, he was talking about television and media and how media and television is pushing things that are completely irrelevant to you. You don't care there's a flood in a neighborhood on the other side of the world in Australia. You really don't care about that. But we're pushing so much information to you just to in, you know, entertain you, right? And now guess what? We've got social media to do that for you as well. So we're paying. We're paying by sacrificing our time. We're paying by creating a really unhealthy culture where trolls foster and lives are destroyed. And not only by trolls, right? We've created a culture of share and forget. When something pops up in our Twitter feed and we see some news about someone doing something wrong, how many of us actually look for the other side of the story? How many of us actually look and think, did they do this? Was it accurate? Was it not? Maybe everyone in this room does, but not a lot of people out there. They just share, they tweet, and they repost, and they repost, and they get trending topics, and it just all goes to hell. I'm sure you've all heard the the life of that lady which tweeted, I'm going to Africa and I hope I don't catch AIDS. Of course not, I'm white. And if you haven't, look it up. Her life was destroyed. There's a talk also by Rod Johnson that you should watch, I recommend. In one, we are creating a society in which we're praying judge, executioner, and everything. 
and we say we're empowering ourselves with social media, actually what we're doing is silencing ourselves in a sense. Because we're not really caring about facts and the truth. We're just sharing and forgetting. We're moving on with our lives. And we're making the irrelevant completely relevant. And of course, last but not least, we have this concept of free application. Anything that you can think about, there's an app for that. What do I eat? There's an app for that. I landed here from uh, Spain. I don't even use TripAdvisor on my phone. I landed, got off the plane, TripAdvisor said, welcome to London. Are you hungry? I'm like, okay. We have things that tell us when we exercise and when we sit on our ass. We have the same now for our dogs. We have applications that tell us when we work, when we don't work. Right? It monitors all our applications. What are we working on? When are we procrastinating? We have applications talking about where we go, who we see, who's there, where we don't go, how long we've been there. I mean, I use, I'm guilty of this myself. Right? I use Google Now. Last week I was in St. Petersburg. I just flip my phone on Android and it shows me my flight, my meetings, my parking location. That was just because I got off some taxi and it thinks that that's my parking location. And just everything. Everything is there. It even has information about, you know, going from English to Russian, the currency rate, stories that apparently I'm interested in. And what I'm doing, obviously, I'm training Google because it says, don't show me this kind of story anymore. So I'm continuously training. And Google knows you, right? Google knows everything about you. And of course, now it wants to know about your family too. Welcoming OK Google for the house, right? It's Google Home. And I'm not picking on Google, obviously. You know, th this is where we're leading. We can use Amazon as well for exactly the same thing. And what's the worst part is that the, the, these little things that pop up in this sea of irrelevance that we're no longer paying attention to, such as, oh, Google Voice search records and keeps conversations around you. Go to the settings in Google and see how much information they actually have about you. Or Facebook actually is using what people lis is, is listening to what people say, whether you're actively using Facebook or not. How many of you knew that? There you go. And of course, now we've got facial recognition. I saw that there's a, com uh, there's a couple of people in Russia that have created an application that they say based on all of the information that is available worldwide on cameras, etc., we can get a 70% match. And you know how we're helping them get that 70% match? Every time they say, do you know anyone in this photo? Why don't you tag them? Right? Oh, is that your friend? Tag. Yes, we're creating the most amazing massive database online. And guess what? It's all for free. But of course you say, I really don't have anything to hide. I don't care. Yes. Everybody has something to hide. It's just that they don't think about that. Oh, that. Oh, yes. I shouldn't. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. If my boss finds out I said that. Oh, dear me. Right. So the fact is that we're praying. And we're paying by sacrificing our privacy for convenience. That is what we're doing. We're just paying for privacy because it's convenient. You know, how many of you have read the last privacy policies of your applications recently? Yeah, never. You know the, the amount of crap that they creep in there, right? And they, every time you upload, they update an application and anything, just little things. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, you recently saw that Apple removed someone's files, and then they said, well, it, it was, you know, they subscribed to Apple Music, and then they unsubscribed, and it removed all of their original music as well. Of course, it was a bug, so, which could be a bug. But point is that, you know, I use Spotify. Every two hours, phone, I have to, every six hours, I've got to go and set a setting and say, don't share the music that I listen to because I don't want other people to know what music I listen to. Okay? There is a reason that I like Chili Chili Bang Bang. There is a reason to it. It was my childhood grow up for movie. And yes, we are the, the cliche of we are the product. Yes, we are the product, but we actually do not know to what extent we have become the product, right? And all we're doing is using all of these things and hoping that our data will never be used against us and hopefully it will never be hacked. Now, fortunately, we live in a safe society where nothing gets hacked. LinkedIn. Um, or nothing gets sold, apparently. So in summary, right? You could say, what's the point of this talk? Nothing. I never actually have any points to my talks. Uh, you know, consumer demand is leading us to this, right? Consumers are leading us to creating these applications. It's very simple. If there's a demand, we produce. It's a consumer demand kind of thing, right? But we are also guilty of consuming this. But as producers of this, as developers, as people in IT, we're also guilty. Not guilty, but we have a double 
responsibility. Because we can actually focus on creating things that are sustainable. We can focus on creating things that don't completely evade our prophecy, privacy, invade our prophecy, privacy, right? We don't have to go for the easy option out and say, oh, well, let me just get a 15 million users, create a VC, and throw it out there. Let's think of ways to do this. In fact, and I can even quote Elon Musk, which you can. A couple of days ago, I was listening to him on, a, uh, on an interview, and he was talking about artificial intelligence and his effort around OpenIE. And his point was, let's create an OpenIE so distributed, so accessible, that each person basically has their own bot, their own artificial intelligence, without inv invading into their privacy. We can. It's a challenge for us. Instead of complaining about, oh, ads are disgusting, let's think of ways how we could potentially solve that. Let's disrupt the industry. You know, and to sum up, this is a nice phrase from uh, Jurassic Park, which I hope you've all seen. And he says, your scientists were so preoccupied whether or not they could, they didn't actually stop to think if they should. Thank you.